All right. So now after the break, let's talk about how to kick things out of the cache when it's full, right? For the direct map cache, you only have one cache block per set. So this part is simple, right? This part is simple. You can just replace the block that 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 is already there because there's only one option, right? The direct map cache, you only have one option. Kick out, kick whatever is there. Kick whatever is already there with the new block that you brought in. So whenever you have access to uh, to the RAM, you bring the data into the cache. If something is already there, you kick it out. For a set associated cache, now you have a choice. Now you have a choice. This is when I talk about, hey, if you have to run 7-Eleven, or uh, if you have to run a, 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 a cafeteria, right? You have to figure out what should you stock for the supply so that you can actually keep selling things that you want to sell, right? So you have a choice and what should be the policy? To design a policy, you have to think about three things. First is insertion. When you brought a new item in, what is that? What's the, what's the uh, importance of that item re 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 relative to the other things in the cache? Promotion is when I have access to something already in the cache. Do I promote the priority of that block? Is, is that block more valuable? Eviction means that if I have a new thing coming in, what do I kick? What do I kick? So we'll first about eviction through the cache replacement policy. So when a cache is full, you need to find which block to evict. Uh, this is called the cache replacement policy. And again, this is a design choice because now we are doing a hardware design. We can choose what we want to do. A dumb decision can be like, I will randomly pick. I will randomly kick the cache block out. You can do first in, first out. You can do something that's more, uh, more common, which is least recently used. We can try to minimize the the, the hardware overhead of the least recently used. So least recently used is one of the common policy that assumed to be like a uh, 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 many, many good baseline for the cash, right? Uh, this is called LIU. And sorry if someone called me. So let me, let me take this qu uh, quickly. I'll be right back. Okay, so I don't really know why there's so many like uh, commercial calls these days. That's rude. Um, so this is a design choice, as I said, right? And the least recently used is really, really common in modern day cache design. Sometimes we call this the LIU. But in real, in the re in reality, when you look at the CPU and you look at the hardware design to implement a full blown LIU is actually pretty costly. So sometimes you go with the not most recently used, or we try to imitate the LIU policy. Uh, you can also use least frequently used or not likely to be used again. So the not likely to be used again is actually pretty hard to determine. But it's, it's a good policy. But it's, but it's also really hard to make it realistic, so. Too hard to design. It's, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's, it can be hard to design, I guess. It's, it's hard to design. Or you can have a hybrid policy, which is like a mix of these two. We will pick out the, say, LIU policy, and if it doesn't work, then you, you can do random, for example, right? So the, the question, the research question that we are we will we'll ask is, what is the optimal policy? What's the best policy, right? So the one that typically is available in the CPU, we will try to do something that imitate least recently used because it, this is based on temporal and spatial locality. So the cache that has not been used for a while are not likely to be accessed again, right? So that's LIU. If I haven't touched that block in a long time, 
I will kick that block because I assume that I'm done using it. The benefit is it's likely to be effective, but the downside is this is really, really costly to implement, especially when the associativity is high. Let's say you have an eight-way cache, for example, like eight-way cache. It means that every time you access the cache, you have to compare a bunch of things. Worst case, eight different items. Uh, you can kind of optimize the implementation, do it in levels and like in a tree-like manner, but still pretty costly to do, right? So you cannot really easily implement uh, a 5 4 queue in hardware to sort what's the least recently used block. Because you have to maintain the order. Maintaining the order in hardware is almost uh, too costly, basically. It's really costly. So you can approximate the LIU by using the not most recently used. Or you can use a hierarchical design. Let's say you have 16-way set associative cache, then I will group them into four, and then I'll pick the not most recently used out of those four, and then I have the second layer, which will pick the not most recently used out of the, the, the four top choices, right? Uh, so basically, it's something like this. So let's say you have 16 different options here, right? And in here you have each uh, four different blocks, right? And this, the highlighted block, let's say this is the most, re most recently used, right? So let's say these are the most recently used MIU block, right? So what pol the policy can do is now we can group them into four, right? This group. This group, this group, and the last group. And we will randomly pick one of the three choice. I as long as I thought I as long as I don't pick the most recently used, I'm fine. So let's say by a random chance I pick this guy. For this group, I pick this guy. For this group, I pick this guy. And for this group, I pick this guy. Right. Then that's the first level. The second level, then you compare, right? You compare this. You compare this. I need my pen back. I'm sorry about this again. So now for this group, I can pick this and then pick this guy, right? And then I'll just pick, say, not MRU again in the second level. So let's say out of those four blocks, right? Out of those four blocks, the MIU is this. It means that the other three can be a candidate. So this is the hierarchical design which try to imitate the LIU policy. And then again, with the LIU policy, you can run into the problem called set thrashing. What is set thrashing? So let's say I have too many data mapped to the same set, uh, something like this. Let's say I have a four-way cache, right? The code goes through the pattern A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. All those four, uh, all those five accesses are different cache blocks that happens to match the same set. So the first access A, I put A in the cache, then go to B, put B in the cache, C, I put C in the cache, D, I put D in the cache. The next access is E. The next access is E. I want to put E in the cache. Because I use LIU, which block will get evicted here? Can someone tell me which block is evicted between A, B, C, or D? Which one is the least recently used out of those four? My program go to this pattern A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. I have a new block come in, E. Which one do I kick out? I will kick out A, right? A get kicked out, replaced by E, right? Now the next access is what? A again, right? Is that a hit or a miss? 
I want to access A, but A just got kicked out. So it's a cache mess. I bring A in again. Which one do I kick out if I use LRU in this case? I kick B out, replace it with A. So let me ask you this question. If I run this program, if I run this program, will I ever get a cache hit? Will I? Is that something that will happen at all? Or will I just getting miss, 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 miss all the time because LIU is not effective? So will I ever get a cache hit? So the next access in this case is uh, uh, B, right? We just kick B out, B kicks C out, C is the next access, C kicks C out. So we will never, we will never in this case get a cache hit. We call this set thrashing. Even though we only access five different things, let's say these are five different integers, right? In total, five integers, 20 bytes, 20 bytes of data. But my program never see a cache hit because they go to the same set and they kick each other out aggressively. So at the end of the day, I never see a cache hit. And this can happen and this is called set thrashing, right? So you can have something like hybrid policy. This is a paper uh, proposed by Moen Qureshi. Uh, he's a, he's, right now he's a professor at Georgia Tech. Uh, this is proposed in ISCA 2006, basically the paper talks about, hey, we can actually sample and see whether LIU is effective or not. If it's not, then you use a random policy. And that's my cat. I'm sorry about that. Um, so you can actually do a hybrid pro policy, which is a mix of the two policy based on the performance as well, right? When you do the cache design. And then this is one uh, one policy I have to talk about. We call Bellini's optimal. This is an older paper it's on the theoretical side of thing, right? Uh, so Bellini optimal basically say that you should evict the block that's going to be re referenced the furthest by the program. This is proposed in 1966, and and this talks about what is the best replacement policy. And in the paper, it kind of proved that. If you do this, that's the best policy you can do. The problem, you need the ability to predict the future, which is impossible. So this is a good theoretical baseline. If you say your policy is close to ability is optimal, awesome. That's like the best you can do, right? It's impossible to implement, but we can simulate it because when you perform a simulation, right, when you Fake run the program. You can design the policy, and you can pick what's the what's the ability. What would ability's optimal would do, and that can be your one of your ideal baseline, right? Does this maximize the execution time? Doesn't always have to, right? It doesn't always maxim uh, minimize the execution time. It, it might be there's just many many other things that can affect the overall latency of running the entire program. Basically, what I'm saying here is cache is important. Having a lot of cache hit is good, but that's not everything in the hardware design. You have the CPU, you have the memory, and, and basically everything combined dictates how fast is your program, not just the cache, right? Cache insertion policy, basically when you insert a new cache block into the cache, do you put that into the MIU position, like the most recently used, this will prevent them from being evicted? Or do you put them into more LIU position, right? Because sometimes you just touch a block once and never touch it again. Uh, this will make them more likely to be evicted, right? Uh, you can look at the two policy called RRIP and DRRIP that talks about the insertion policy. Um, and again, you also have the, the cash promotion policy, right? And for the cash promotion policy, when I access something in a cash block, do I promote them to MIU or do I just leave them alone? Uh, this 
to, to promote them to the MRU, this can be easily done by updating the replacement policy bit saying, hey, this guy is the MRU, most recently used. So this is actually pretty simple to do, right? So now that's it for handling access and figuring out the replacement policy. Next week, we'll talk about more uh, fancy policy about caching and we'll talk about uh, a uh, fancy policy on, on virtual memory as well, right? But before we go there, we have to talk about hand, how, how to handle writes as well, right? So when you write the data, when you update the data, the data actually change, right? So you need to propagate the data to the higher level in the cache hierarchy. Otherwise, you get the old data back, right? So there are two policies called write through and write back. Now, let me motivate first by trying to tell you what is the problem. So let's say I have the L1 right here. This is L1. Uh, this is a bigger L2, right? And this is my DRAM. And this is my cache block, right? Can someone give me any random value, like initial value of this data? It can be any random number. Just can you can someone throw me a number between zero to 10? Any number between zero to 10. There's no wrong answer here. I just need one number. I just say int i equals seven, all right? So this variable i, all right, has the value seven everywhere. I bring them into the cache. Now, let's say it gets modified. Next line, I do i equals can I have a different number other than seven? Any number is fine. Just yeah, okay. Let's do i equals three, right? So when I have i equals three, it means what? It means that I have a right. I have a right to that address and it change the value to three. So this become three. Now, do you see what happened to L2 and L3, uh, L2 and DRAM? I modified L1 to be three, right? So what do I do here? What, what's the problem here? So what's the first problem? It's a cache hit. I do a cache write, right? And it's a cache hit. And it's a cache hit. So I just go to L1, update the data and say, hey, I'm done. But what's the problem here? Am I done? Well, not exactly, right? Because the L2 and uh, DRAM still have the old data, right? So in this case, the data are different, right? And we want to make sure your program execute correctly, right? If you need to access I, it should have the value three, not seven. So you have two policies. The first policy is simple, it's called write through. So whenever I modify the data here to from, from seven to three, what can I do? I can then change, right? The, the write to policy means that I change everything here to three. And now are we done? Are we done? Well, we're done, right? But it also means that if I use the write through policy, every time I write, I have to modify L1, L2, and DRAM, L1 and 2 DRAM, L1 and 2 DRAM, L1 and 2 DRAM. That's a lot of bandwidth you're using because you're modifying a lot of things, right? So this can be kind of wasteful because if you think about it, right? If you if you really kind of consider this L1. So let's say I have a future access. So let's say I have a future access. In the future, I say, hey, uh, 
a equals i. I want to access, I want to read the value of i afterward. I first go to L1 cache, right? I would first go to the L1 cache. So am I good here? Do I run into any problems here? Is that, a, for, let me first ask this, is that an L1 hit? I want to see, hey, I have this address i. I want to get the data. Is that an L1 hit? Yes, right, it's an L1 hit. So in that case, what are you gonna get for the data, right? Yeah, we just need to check L1 and say, like, hey, it's a hit, so three. So we get the correct data, right? But we, we are not completely done, uh, as you guys said, right? So how can we make sure that if this block is no longer in L1, then, L2 need to update the data with the correct data. That's the right back policy. That's the right back policy. So let me ask you this. When will this block no longer be in L1? That's when the block get evicted, right? That's when someone kicked the data out. That's when someone kicked the data out. So what can I do here? As I said, that's this thing called the dirty bit. So let's say you have write to the data. When you write something to the data, you mark them as this is a dirty data. When you mark them as the dirty data, it basically means that if the block get kicked out of L1, go update the value in L2, uh, L2 the, the high le higher level cache. So when eviction happen, like let's say eviction happen, this block is gone, right? This block is gone. Make sure you update this to three and also this is the dirty bit, right? So that when this block is gone from L2, you then update this to three. This is a write back policy. What it really does is you delay, you delay the update as long as possible, right? You delay the update as long as possible because you don't need to, it's a cash hit, right? It's a cache hit, it's already in L1. You don't need to update L2 and DRAM. In that way, if you have another modification to I, then from three, you can change to two, change to zero without touching L2 and DRAM. This will save bandwidth and energy. So most of the time your CPU would then use a write back cache, right? To make sure you do, you delay the update. So that's how you handle the writes. The second thing is when you have a write miss, you also have a choice of you allocate, whether you want to allocate a cache block or not, right? You can allocate a write miss to the cache block, right? Writes will be treated the same as read, and you can consolidate multiple writes in multiple level, or you can just not putting that thing in the cache, right? If the write is detected to have low low quality, you can actually avoid and not use the cache as well, right? And there are three classes of cache misses. First, compulsory misses. You never seen this data for the first time, so you can prefetch. Again, we'll talk about prefetch in the uh, in, in 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 the next lecture, right? So if you see the data for the first time, it's gonna be a cache miss because it's not in the cache or you never brought it in. That's a compulsory miss. The next type is conflict miss. The conflict miss is when I, I, I talk about set thrashing. That example is a conflict miss. You might have room in the cache, but that set is full. That set is full. So the data mismapped to the same set, then there's a conflict miss. Capacity miss is basically you run out of cache. Your cache is too small, right? So to, to get uh, to, to mitigate conflict miss and capacity miss, you can manage the cache better and you can also increase the size of the cache to uh, mitigate the performance impact of these type of cache, uh, cache misses.
And to measure the performance of the cache, most of the time you would look at the cache hit rate and miss rate for each level and what's the cost of the hit and miss so that you can kind of figure out what's the total cost of the load, how long it takes to actually access my data. So I'm going to uh, then talk about, so, so there'll be some, some small exercise in a few more slides, but before that, because we are doing a PhD class here, right? We should talk about what else can we do to improve the performance, right? To, to lead into the, the lecture next week. So you can try to reduce the miss rate, more cache associativity, uh, better management of the data in the cache, change the replacement and insertion policy. Uh, you can prefetch data into the cache. So our review paper that we ask you to review some of these are actually talk about caching policies. So feel free to check them out and, and, and do the review on those policy. You can also reduce the missed latency. You add more caching level so that when you have a cache miss, it's, it's go to the next level. You can try to figure out whether you want to have a, a, a store, putting the store data into the cache because store doesn't really stall your pipeline. When you store the data, you don't stall, uh, stall the pipeline. The next instruction can go forward because it's in the store buffer. You already have the updated version of the data. You can then do sub-blocking. Sub-blocking means that I will only evict a fraction of the block and try to like make sure I manage the data in a finer granularity. You can change the replacement and insertion policy. You can allow multiple cache misses and process them in parallel. You can have uh, more port accessing the cache so you can uh, have multiple cache access per cycle, right? So these are the hardware changes that we'll discuss. Some of these we'll discuss in the next lecture that talk about how to reduce the miscellaneity. And here again, uh, as I mentioned, like I have a few examples. Let's, let's let's say L1, L2 is uh, two cycles for L1, five cycles for D, uh, L2, and 25 for DRAM. Let's say I have 100 loads and L1 hit rate is 80%, L2 hit rate is 80%. I'll, I'll do this example. I have one more example that looks similar and I'll, 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 I'll let you do it. So in this case, how long does it take? Let's assume I can process only one cache access at the same time and the load happens sequentially. So it's one load after one load after one load, right? So you have 100 loads. They all go to L1. So this is already 200 cycles. Right, and then 80% hit rate. It means that 20% is not hitting. So 20% of those, 20 of them go to L2. L2 take five cycles, so that's 100 cycle in total, right? And then 80% hit rate again. So it's we have four more that have to go to DRAM, right? Four more that go to DRAM, and those four would take 25 multiplied by four, so that's 100 more cycles. So in total, this would take how, how much? 400 cycle, right? So this 100 loads would take 400 cycles. It's much better that we have the cache because if you all have to go to DRAM, if all of these have to go to DRAM, that's 2,500 cycles, about six times worse, right? Your, your program is likely to be a lot slower in that case. So that's our first example. Uh, you can go try doing the second example. Now you have a much better hit rate, but you issues a lot more uh, a lot more loads, right? Uh, you can try to figure out what's the uh, number of cycles that, that we have to do to, to run this 1,000 load. Again, now we talk about from the perspective of your, your, your you as a programmer, right? You can try to improve the cache hit rate by uh, making sure if you have a large loop that cover a big range of data, make the loop smaller so that when you loop around in the innermost loop, it fits in the cache, right? So basically this means that your innermost loop, uh, inner loop fits in the cache, right? This means basically we'll, we'll, we'll enforce that inside the loop, 
everything is in the cache. So most of the time when you run the program, it's a cache hit, right? Uh, you can also try to like change the way you access your data between row, 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 row of data to column to column of data because that also impact the cache performance, right? Uh, also, please remember that one cache block is multiple words of data. So if you access data sequentially, you have a lot of cache hits. But if you go block by block by block by block by block, then you might have a lot of cache misses, right? Uh, you can reduce the number of memory access because this memory access is it takes a long time, right? So you can change the algorithm that maybe use a lot of compute, do a lot more ads, but it's cheaper, right, to go to the memory compared to, compared to the case when you go to the memory. And this is actually something that happened in most modern day high performance library, right? Uh, you can try to to program uh, and allow like the the way you use data structure that are more cache friendly. Things that people do actually when you implement this library uh, can be things like I would send a command to check the size of my cache and check the associativity of my cache, and then I will make sure that I my data structure fit. In the cache, like most of the access in a data structure would fit in a cache and have a cache hit, right? This would make sure that your program rarely need to go to DRAM for your data because it does matter for performance, right? Now, again, now that we are going to switch to virtual memory topic, I don't think we can finish the entire thing, but let me motivate. Let me motivate what's virtual memory after the break. So let me stop the recording right now, and then we'll resume with part four of this lecture.